So this morning I want to introduce you to a certain person. And this person, we're going to leave him, leave him nameless. We're not going to name any names. But you all know, you all know this person. You all know him or her. Perhaps you have worked with this person. Uh, or perhaps he's a, a member of your, your family. And what you know about this person is that he has an amazing talent and, and an amazing ability that if they would just do it, they would be successful and acquire uh, great wealth, great financial wealth, uh, generational wealth if they applied this ability. But there stands that obstacle in front of them that keeps them from doing this. It keeps them from, from, from attaining that wealth or that success. This person whom we all know, hopefully you've got a person or a character in mind, just straight out refuses to apply themselves, apply that ability to do this thing. They have, they have the ability, but they do not apply it. And, and for those of us who do not have this ability, it, it frustrates us. Uh, we, we, we're like, wow, if I had their ability, I would dot, dot, dot. We, we, we simply do not understand why they do not do what is necessary to be the success. They don't apply themselves in, in, their, in their job to promote or, or even to be competent. They're considered as useless by their employer and even to other co-workers that have to take up their slack who don't have this innate ability. And it seems like, like such a waste. I think we all know someone that at least partially is described by that. Well, a, a, a person that, that, that is giving something and, and, and seems to waste it, to squander it. Well, Christians can be this type of person at least at times. And Peter writes about this here in his second letter. Uh, our, our text before us this morning, the first eight verses. So I want you to keep this person in mind uh, as we begin and as we go through. So please look with me at verse 1. <clears throat> Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received the same kind of faith as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Peter addresses this letter <clears throat> to those who have received the same kind of faith as ours. So it's, in, it's important to understand to whom the author is writing. A, a, a good student of the Bible, and we should all be good students of the Bible, must ask this essential question when, when considering a text. To whom is this written? It's the context of, of what we're reading. For instance, when we read of, of certain laws that were, were, were given to Israel, uh, we know that they're, they're not intended as a rule for us today, but they were given to they were given to Israel to a people who had just been saved from slavery in Egypt. We know that uh, that's applicable to them, uh, not necessarily applicable to us, except through a type and shadow of the forecoming Messiah. And so it is with this letter. We read that the author is, is the apostle Peter, and then we see who he is writing to, uh, to those who have received the same kind of faith as ours. 
So what is the same kind of faith as ours? Well, this faith is of the apostles. It's of the eyewitnesses of Christ. <laughs> Called by Christ, eyewitnesses of Christ. Jesus of Nazareth. The, the eyewitnesses of his majesty, as Peter will go on and say uh, later on in this chapter, in verse 16, he says, For we did not make known to you the power in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, following cleverly devised myths, but being eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter's letter is written to a specific audience, those who have faith in Christ. But this is not only just a faith in Christ, this is the right kind of faith in Christ. And that's what I've titled this sermon this morning, The Right Kind of Faith. The Right Kind of Faith in Christ. It's not a faith in the apostles, but a faith in the Christ and his accomplished salvation for his people it's not a, a a faith in physical healing that was granted to the apostles which confirmed their their special calling but that physical healing that ability given to the apostles which confirmed uh, their calling had no salvific weight to it it could not save the, the, the God-given ability to heal uh, people does not carry with it um, the salvation of that person, does not necessarily carry with it the salvation that, of that person physically healed. <clears throat> we can call to mind uh, today those who, in the name of Jesus, place so much emphasis on the physical healing of people that it, it, it diminishes the majesty of spiritual salvation in Christ. Their, their, their faith then is in the healing <coughs> of their sicknesses and, and diseases and, and deformities. Their faith is not in the atonement for sin that Christ fully and effectively made for those who have the, the right kind of faith in him. If a person would be miraculously healed of their physical ailment, then they would be healed of that ailment, ailment, but not necessarily healed of their spiritual death. Physical healing is not normative. <coughs> it has not been since the, since the time of the apostles, since they died. This is not the right kind of faith. This is not to whom this letter is addressed. What Peter is writing about is also not a faith of traditions or, uh, or laws that, the, for instance, the Jews clung to. A faith that, that, that saves by, by keeping the law given to them instead of faith in the one <clears throat> the promised Christ that would be and is the only human to be able to keep that law fully. This type of faith that has plagued Christianity throughout history, this faith of works. This is a faith that <coughs> it's a faith that, that that places its hope in the belief that mankind has the ability to do what is necessary to, to, to gain salvation. That humans have the ability to fulfill any requirements of salvation, to, to appease God by their own capabilities. Even if that, even if that power to do that is given to them by, by God or, or God's. Because we see that in other religions, correct? The, the gods that <clears throat> these other religions have or 
whatever higher power they have or, or higher ideal can be placated uh, or if it's an ideal can be attained by doing what is necessary and required of them. It doesn't matter what, what name you give to this, this God or this ideal. It is at its core all the same. It's the same thing. And we could go, <clears throat> we could go through the list of religions name by name. Just think of one in, in your head. Any other religion that is not of the right kind of faith in Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. This includes those false religions that, that claim to be under Christ, even those commonly believed to be uh, under the umbrella of Christianity. It is a, a man-invented religion. It has a faith in, in mankind. It's <coughs> humanistic. It is Antichrist. Anti Christ. It's against Christ. It is satanic. You either have Christianity or you have not Christianity. <clears throat> you either have uh, Christian Christianity that is is has as its hope in the fact that Christ is done. But his creation could not do. Or you have everything else that, that places it, its hope and, and its power into the person, the created being, to gain salvation, thereby denying Christ. Denying what Christ, who Christ says he is. It is against Christ. It is anti-Christ. And it is satanic. This is not the right kind of faith. This is not to whom this letter is addressed. Who Peter is addressing is those who have a, <clears throat> a, a, a true saving faith in Christ. It's not a faith that... <clears throat> One simply acknowledges or says that they have and then continues to live as they did prior to salvation because there's been no repentance for their sin. They see no, no need for repentance. There's been no rejection of themselves and a turning to Christ. They, they simply want the blessing of Christ so that they can continue to live for their own selfish desires. The true saving faith in Christ is also not a, a weak, temporary faith that can be taken away when the, 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 when the person sins after a supposed conversion. <clears throat> because true repentance and true faith can only happen because it is granted to us. It is granted to a person who is in Christ by God. What has been done by God cannot be undone by the person. <clears throat> the right kind of faith is the faith of those who are in Christ. That is, they are of God's choosing. And, and they've been given this, this right kind of faith by God with a right kind of faith in the Son, Christ Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it, it, is, it is to these people of God and Christ whom Peter is addressing. These people who have received Notice our text received the right kind of faith by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. As we continue on in verse 1. And this confirms 
this confirms how a Christian attains the right kind of faith <clears throat> by the righteousness of God of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. First of all, it is received. That's an important word here. It's it's received because it's not an inherent characteristics characteristic of a, a created being. It is not intrinsic to the human nature. It, it, it is is alien and it's it, it's completely foreign to our nature. It is not a a component of, of, of mankind's constitution because our representative, the first man Adam, brought sin into the world and, and as our our collective representative, our, our federal head, that sin that he brought in <clears throat> is now our nature. It permeates every aspect of our being as a human. If you recall some of this from uh, Pastor Kyle's sermon last Lord's Day. So no, a, a person then is spiritually alienated, dead from God. Our, our nature is is self worshiping, as as opposed to God worshiping, as and as we previously covered, our hope, our, our faith is in ourselves and our own abilities instead of in Christ and in His ability. So this right kind of faith that Peter is describing is is alien to humanity. It is is foreign to you and to I. It is it is extrinsic, not intrinsic, to our, our, our character, to our will, to our entire being. Therefore, it has to be introduced to us. It has to be given to us. It has to come from without. Uh, being being foreign, it has to be e inaugurated and, and instituted into our being. This hope and, and faith is, is not added to our sinful nature. It must be created within us. Our, 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 our nature must be changed, recreated, into something new, a new creation. The, the, the old must die before the new is brought forth. We are given a, a new life in place of the old dead life, the many created as one people. And that's amazing that the many are created as one people. people. Peter writes to those who have received the same kind of faith. This means that you, <clears throat> if you have received this faith, have this right kind of faith, and are in Christ, you have the same faith as someone that you have never even met before never heard of before the same kind of faith as those who who uh, lived thousands of years ago as strangers we have never met we have the same kind of faith the the the, the, the woman in China the, the 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 man in Australia the young teen in Africa has the same kind of faith as you. <coughs> so you're not really strangers then. We're, we are brothers and sisters. The, the people of Christ, not divided, but united by the precious blood of Christ. You and, and Lydia of Thyatira are connected by having the same kind of of faith, these people we read about, we have the same kind of faith, the right kind of faith. 
And that, just stopping and thinking about that overwhelms me. That's hard to grasp. That's immense. It excites me. It makes me happy. But we receive this new life, this <clears throat> right kind of faith, faith this, this gift of, of mercy and grace from God, our, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is in this introduction from Peter that he explains his intended audience. It, it is those who have the right kind of faith. And then from his introduction, Peter explains even further about this right kind of faith. Please look with me at verse 2. Peter writes, <clears throat> Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of Jesus <clears throat> our Lord. <clears throat> I was entirely fine until I got up here. And then that frog jumped in there. So, <clears throat> Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So the right kind of faith is the, the full knowledge of Christ. So it is imperative then that we, as Christians, understand what this full knowledge of Christ is. It's a necessary element of Christianity. If we claim Christ as our King and our, our hope of salvation, it is essential that we have a, a full knowledge of Him so that we do not fall into error or are deceived into following a, 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 a Jesus of our own creation. But keep in mind that having a, a full knowledge of Jesus is not the same as having a complete knowledge of him. Because it's not possible for the created being to fully grasp the majesty, the, the righteousness, and the glory of God. The finite cannot fully comprehend the infinite. The lesser is not greater than the ultimate. And in the full knowledge of Christ, we receive grace and peace. We see those two words put together in so many introductions of the apostles, and <clears throat> we probably don't think about these two words enough. But in the full knowledge of Christ, we receive grace and peace. And here Peter desires that this grace and this peace be multiplied. Not just a little grace and not just a little peace, but a lot increasing uh, grace and peace that have been multiplied. And it's an amazing comfort to have the peace of Christ. The <clears throat> hope and the certainty that we have eternal life with Him, knowing that we cannot die a second death, a, a spiritual death, brings with it such a peace to the Christian. When brothers and sisters we know die, we have a peace in their death, a joy. We grieve them, we miss them, but we have immense joy of what they've attained, what they've found face to face with Christ. And then that, that peace, all the worries and the pains that we feel in this life, we, we, we pray for at the beginning of the service. We, we send texts to each other. We ask for prayer for the, these pains and ailments and, and diseases that we have. And we're able, to, they're able to be dealt with and endured because we know that they are but temporary. Every fruitless effort that we see those who are, are, are left 
in their own weak power. Every effort that we see them spend trying to fill an emptiness that cannot be filled, every vain work that they do to prove their worth to the world, to themselves, to, to show that they matter, this endless searching and, and, and doing it is chaos in their mind. It causes bitterness <coughs> and envy in their hearts. It, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's tiring to always try to be better than someone else. And to always be number one on your list of priorities. It's exhausting. And this is not peace. It's confusion and disorder. It's an impossible undertaking with an unattainable goal. It is a war against the holiness of God and his character. Who he says, <clears throat> who he says he is, as revealed in both nature and and in Holy Scripture, peace comes from being in a re right relationship with Christ. Peace comes from having the right kind of faith in Jesus. Peace comes from the, the grace of being in a right relationship with Christ. It's his, his friendliness toward us. It's his goodness that, that showered upon us, his, his kindness and, and favor in our lives by his, his glory shining in our giving glory to him and, and not to ourselves. <clears throat> Grace is the gospel shared with others in love. In love for them out of our abundance of love for Christ who, who fills us with his love. It is Christ's righteousness and love that is displayed in us. And as Peter says, may this be multiplied, increased. May it be increased in us in the full knowledge of Christ. <coughs> Through the full knowledge of Christ, not only does Christ give us grace and peace, he also gives us, and look at this, everything pertaining, everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything. We're given everything. That means we contribute nothing. And that's a wonderful thing because most of us, okay, all of us, <laughs> would fail miserably if we had to supply what was needed for a righteous life and godliness. As a matter of fact, prior to Christ, that is exactly what we tried to do, and we failed entirely. That's what all of those other religions try to accomplish and fail to do. They try to accomplish on their own what can only be done through Christ. We, we, don't, we don't meet Christ halfway or, or even part of the way. Christ does it all. He has done it all for those who are in Christ. And we see this in verse 3, correct? His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. The, the, glory, the glorious and most excellent Christ called us to be his own. And in this full knowledge of him, this, this grace and peace creating us anew, a new creation, and by his divine power, he has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. He hasn't just given us a, a, a little bit of knowledge of him. He's given us full knowledge of him. And he hasn't just given us 
partial abilities for a godly life. He has given us everything. There's nothing lacking. And he's able to do this because he is God. He is divine. His power is divine. It is, it is ultimate. His glory and excellence is ultimate because it is God's glory and excellence. There's, there's no higher level uh, of glory or excellence. It's the greatest degree of glory and power and excellence. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm failing here because I'm trying to describe the power and glory and excellence of Christ and it's indescribable. It is unlimited and infinite, but the words that I have and, and are using somehow indicate that it is measurable. But it is immeasurable. We simply cannot describe or explain or, or measure the excellencies of Christ. It's like it's like trying to describe the heights of heaven, but there's there's no end. There's no end to the excellencies and power and glory of our Lord Christ Jesus. And these immeasurable attributes are the reason that he is able to give us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Christ takes people marred by sin and he gives to them. And Look at this in verse 4. Christ takes people marred by sin. He gives to them precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. So Christ immeasurable emits endless, infinite, and, and limitless divine power is shared with us. We, we become partakers of his godliness. His holiness, partakers of his righteousness, which is his very nature. We become in Christ. <sighs> Let that sink in. We become in Christ. We are in Christ. We, we share in his divine nature. We whose, whose nature prior to Christ was corrupted and, and wicked and evil, pervasively sinful, slaves to sin and spiritually dead. That was our nature. But now in Christ, our nature is godly. It is divine because it is in Christ. Through no power of our own, but through the power of God. And in, in verse 4, it's referred to as precious. Precious. Precious and magnificent promises. What is, what is precious to you? your spouse, your wife, your husband, your children. <coughs> These are, are precious to you. you. You have a high value for them. This full knowledge of Jesus and being in him, partaking in his godliness and righteousness and holiness, this is precious. We who are in Christ, we value these realities, these promises, more than we value even our own lives, even our own families. How many in uh, surrendering the war against God 
and repenting of their sin against God, and then hoping in the atoning work of Christ, have lost families. Have lost valued employment. It's, it's not really common here in the United States or in other places we can think of, but, but think of the person... <clears throat> Think of the person in that predominantly Muslim area, in that Muslim family, uh, who may lose his life <clears throat> for trusting in Christ and, and rejecting the false religion of his family. Think of the Jew who's, who loses respect and his family for being in Christ. And we, in Acts, we just read of the Jews in the time of the apostles who were martyred or, or outcast because of their hope in the risen Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Thousands and thousands of martyrs throughout history murdered for their belief in Jesus as the Christ. They valued Christ above all. To them, as us, he is precious. The gospel of Christ is precious. And if we have this, this precious, magnificent, immeasurable power and righteousness in Christ, how then can we ever desire the corruption, the sin that is in the world? Notice here at the end of verse 4 that it describes that we have <coughs> escaped corruption. Let me describe it this way. You have a job, and it's a, it's a good job with good pay, and the, the work environment is pleasant. You enjoy going to work every day, but you, you learn of a position that's in another company that offers better pay and better benefits with less stress and work uh, that is currently required of you. And there's a much better opportunity for advancement, for promotion at this other job. So you apply for this job at this other company and you get this position. Yay! So you leave the old company for the new one. <clears throat> and, and with that leaving... There's no hard feelings. You've enjoyed your time and uh, you even keep in touch with your old co-workers through uh, social media and text. Telegraph something. You've simply left something good for something better. Now imagine... <clears throat> This is going to be a reality for some. Now imagine that you're stuck in a job that pays you just enough to cover the bills. An emergency, financial emergencies, cause all sorts of stress and, and, and frustration, which leads to marital problems and relationship problems. There's no, uh, there's no opportunity to advance. Your supervisor or supervisors are always yelling at you and not communicating and then constantly blaming you and the other workers for the, the faults of the company. And due to the rising cost of materials, they're going to have to do away with uh, some of the few benefits that you receive and have also placed you on mandatory 12-hour shifts to cover their lack and ability to keep employees. So you learn of this other job at the other company, as I've described before. You apply and you get the job. Yay. Now you have escaped that job. Escaping implies that you were held in bondage. Uh, escaping means that you uh, were, were subdued and, and, and miserable, but now you have freedom. You are no longer a slave, but free. 
we who are in Christ have escaped that bondage and corruption of the world that is corrupted by lust. The, the lust for things that are not of Christ. They're not godly. They're not righteous. They're not holy. Having the, the, the full knowledge of Christ, we no longer lust after the corrupted things of this world. We no longer desire the, the temporary, but long for the precious, precious promises in the age to come, the precious promises of Christ. Because we share in the godliness of Christ, his divine nature. amazing but let's continue on in verses 5 through 7 like yeah he's not going verse by verse he's actually going to look at three verses this time that's a good thing right second peter uh, chapter 1 verses 5 through 7 now for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. We who are in Christ have been given a precious gift. Our old nature is done away with. We have a new nature, a, a nature that is of the divine nature of Christ Jesus. By his divine power, he has given to us everything we need to live a life that is characterized by godliness through the full knowledge of him. And this new life, has a requirement for us. This new life is, is characterized by, by holiness, which is displayed in our actions. And, and these are laid out for us here in these three verses. They tell us how we who are in Christ should live, how we are to behave. Uh, this is what we must do. Now, these lists, these characteristics are, are not sequential or, or causal. Um, that is, they, they, they are not to be done in order uh, so that you do the first one and then you can do the second one and so on and so on. Or even that, that doing one leads you to the next. They're, they're not... They're not steps to take, but, but they're all encompassing of the character of the Christian life. So after saying that, don't be confused by my terminology that I'm getting ready to use. <laughs> because I'm going to use the term first. <clears throat> because it's important here. Uh, look with me there. It says first we have to be Diligent. We have to be uh, diligent in our Christian life to be these described characteristics. That means we have to put in work. And there are no breaks in this work. It is a constant work. Every action and behavior that we have should be... Um, Occupied and, and, and focused on being and doing these things. Now, remember, we have been given everything we need to do this by the power of Christ. So let's look at these. We are to have faith in Christ, the right kind of faith. We are to have moral excellence. That means our, our, our morals are, are 
are doing good and not doing bad should demonstrate our faith. Our, our, our morals are, are grounded in God and His standard as revealed in Scripture. Our knowledge of God and righteousness should be ever increasing. We should be diligent students of God's Word. For how can we have the right kind of faith and the full knowledge of Christ if we are ignorant of who Christ is? Our lives, <laughs> our lives should be marked by self-control. I'm, I'm hearing Vody Blackham in my head saying, if no one says amen, somebody should say ouch. Because our lives should be marked by self-control. Ouch. If we have escaped the corruption in the world by lust, why then would we lust after other things? Why, why would we overindulge in the things of this world? Food, alcohol, sex. We've escaped that. Stop it. <laughs> Ouch. Now I want to move past perseverance because I want to come back to that. One who is in Christ should be described as, as godly. We, we, we've all heard that, right? Just, he's a godly man. We've heard that uh, description of, of someone before. She's a, a godly woman. She's a godly wife. Our, our lives should portray the godliness of Christ because we are of his nature. Remember verse 3, grant, he granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Our lives should portray the godliness of Christ. Let's finish up with brotherly kindness and love. Can you be can you be loving but not be kind? I would present to you think about this parents that you love your children but when they do something stupid are you always kind in your, in your remarks and your discipline of them? Yep. Ouch. Right? We should be known as kind people, as loving people. Romans, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 10, uh, being de devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. Think of this in, in, in opposing characteristics. We should not be known as being hateful or mean, cynical, or curmudgeon. Oh, <laughs> we should be we should be known as kind and loving. Our our words and our actions should be marked by kindness and peacefulness and, and they should be truthful and, and, and full of grace and used for the building up of people and not the tearing down of people. So now let's think about perseverance. Jesus says to his disciples in, in Luke 29 or 21 verse 19, he says, by your perseverance you will gain your lives if we if we persevere in our faith until we die or until Jesus returns then this proves or, or demonstrates that uh, we have indeed been partakers of the divine nature in Christ through the full knowledge of our precious Lord and Savior that our our faith is the same kind of faith 
of the apostles and, and those thousands of others that have been called by God. That we have escaped from, from the, the bondage to sin and have been freed by Christ and are now slaves to his righteousness and holiness and power. Never to be fearful of his judgment because we are no longer condemned but are fully and completely justified because Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, became our curse and, and suffered the wrath of the Father, the, the, the wrath and the penalty that we were responsible for. Christ endured on our behalf. So our, our perseverance proves our salvation. It, it is, to, to, to use the, the saying, the, the fruit of our root. And the, the fruit being moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And our root being Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for if these things are yours and are increasing, they rendered you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are called and if you are in Christ, you're, you're, you're called to be holy, not lazy. We are to work hard and, and, and constantly in the power of Christ, that gift that he's given us, to live our lives that are indicative of Christ. And you've heard this before, very recently, last week. Pastor Kyle preaching, uh, 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 preached about this last week. Uh, he said, good works flow from our salvation. He was teaching that, that service is one of the core components of a Christian's life and, and is an evidence that we are truly a Christian. So I'm not teaching anything new. You've heard it before. I'm just telling it to you again. Tell them, tell them again, tell them what you told them, right? And I've forgotten how many times this morning I've used the term in Christ. I want to end with some questions that I pray cause us to consider our, our lives. Right, we come here to read God's word, to, to praise him, and to learn, to become different. So I want to ask these questions to ask of our lives so that it forces us and it confronts us to be different, to be changed by God's word as we leave here. Our, <clears throat> our behaviors, our, our actions, our word, our, our characteristics, our, our, our being, are they representative of a life, a, a new life, that has been given to us by Christ. Are you, are you indeed in Christ? If you're, if not, I, I want you to understand that. <clears throat> I want you to understand that you're supposed to be in Christ. That's what we're created for. That endless tireless chasing of, of, of things will never bring you happiness. They're just arbitrarily created rules that you've created or accepted to where you consider yourself to be a good person. You can, you can never reach that ideal that you have. You can never... Uh, Work your way to salvation by doing good things or even by being a good person and being a, a, a moral person to other people.
If you're not in Christ, you are separated from Christ, which means that you are condemned. And the penalty for this is unending torment and punishment under the wrath of God, your creator and judge whose holiness simply cannot overlook your sin. To be in Christ, in Christ, <clears throat> reject, reject your your your, your spiritually dead, uh, selfish life, and trust in Christ for His pardon, for His 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 freedom, for His peace, His grace, and His mercy, His atonement. If you are in Christ, <clears throat> I ask you this question. Which of these characteristics do you need to work on? A, a better way, <clears throat> a better way to put this in light of this text, or a better way to ask this in light of this text is, which of these characteristics are you fighting against? Are, are, you, are you quenching? You've been given everything you need to diligently do them, to constantly do them. So which ones are you not being diligent about? Again, ouch. we do not want to be either useless or unfruitful in regards to Christ. Read again verse 8. For if these things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we do? We confess your laziness. For that's what it is and begin anew. Determine to, to persevere in the power and the righteousness of Christ that's been granted to us because this demonstrates that we do indeed have the right kind of faith. Please pray with me. Father, we stand completely humbled by your words to us. Father, we know that they're, they are needed and we thank you for them. Father, we confess that we uh, at times are lazy, that at times we are focused upon ourselves. And in doing so, That word precious is far away from us. We forget the precious promises that you have made to us. Father, help us. We know you've given us the strength already, but help us to be constant in our work, to overwhelm every thought that we have that is not of you. keep our focus upon your son and what he's done what he has given to us given us new life a life a life that's not a stranger to you but a life that is a friend and in good standing before you father may these words this this text uh, embolden us and encourage us as we go forth. May they always be in our thoughts, in our hearts. May our, our hearts be closer to you. May our, our faith be increased as we leave here. May our obedience be 
and joyful towards you. May our words always be loving and kind. May you give us a desire and a hunger for more of your word, a thirst for a full knowledge of your son. It's in his name that we ask these things, that we pray, that we, we worship you and praise you. Our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, amen.